What is your financial situation? Is your business on solid ground or are there some cracks in the foundation that have you concerned about the future? We'll jump into ag economic conditions and let's get crop reports from Iowa and North Carolina in this week's Farmer Forum. Live, having conducted very specific broadcasting vocal exercises via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. This morning, we'll begin our monthly conversation with uh, Dr. Jim Mintert from Purdue. Then it's our Farmer Forum with panelists Tim Barak and Frank Howie. I'm handsome newsman Davis Michelson, and now the host of AgriTalk, Chip Flory. All right, Davis, hey, thank you so much. Yeah, the Ag Economic Barometer you- for July has been released and it showed some improvement in attitudes Mm -hmm. it really did yeah feels good i i'm a little surprised Mm -hmm. with the way that the grain markets have been trading uh i'm a bit surprised that that some optimism uh, yeah you gotta call it optimism has snuck back into the barometer we'll talk to jim about that in our monthly conversation with jim and and uh Mm -hmm. We'll take some of that and uh, that conversation and take it over to the Farmer Forum with Tim Burrock from Iowa and Frank Howie from North Carolina. It's it's been a couple, it's been a couple yes. of moments since we've yes. had Frank on the show. Two men. and uh, yes, glad to get him back on here. He's got Hurricane Debbie bearing down on him in yeah. North Carolina, so we'll get his updates on what is going on there how are you this morning i think i'm doing all right uh 73 yeah. degrees uh muted sunshine i guess i would call it although i do have my okay. curtains closed so it's hard to know um it's hard to but know so far sure. a lovely day yeah. i'm feeling good i've done my my broadcast vocal exercises um nice. i've spent some time focusing you know trying to get my mind squared away for the day's work i think i'm ready how about you i am on it 69 degrees uh-huh 69 degrees it's unbelievable we're heading for a high of 78 we'll be there late this afternoon okay but uh right now it is absolutely gorgeous the humidity is low at 78 on august 7th i'll take that anytime anytime yeah. august 7th yeah and here's the deal here we are i'm yeah. looking at nighttime temperatures even clear okay. down here in the constantinople of the midwest yeah. I mean, we're we're six handle on uh, Saturday. They've got sixty even predicted for us overnight. Wow! So when we talk about those nighttime temperatures, I mean, I know you like that. You you're preaching nighttime temperatures. All Is the, time. the nighttime temperatures we need those to offset the the uh, the smoke, the haze, right? Is that how that well, works? You, I don't, man, you're reading things into it now because we don't know what that smoke and haze is. Done I'm before. reading things into it. Yes, all I've done is ask questions. <laughs> I've read nothing into it. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I don't know where you're getting that. Yeah, yeah. up here in the Mile Wide City, uh, we are looking at a low this weekend of low fifties. Like yeah. Fifty one yeah. on Saturday night, so it's going to be beautiful. Mm-hmm. All right, Indeed. let's get to it. What do you got in the news, bud? Sure thing. Well, let's start with the weather. Still talking about Debbie. Tropical moisture from Debbie will track northward with excessive rainfall potential from the Carolinas and eventually into the northeast corridor. Gusty winds will accompany the track of Debbie as the storm tracks northward through the first half of the weekend. Meanwhile, heat and fire weather concerns for the Intermountain West continues for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Excessive heat into Thursday here in the uh, nation's belly button chip. uh, we're going to have a, a decent week here as far as uh, oh, cool beautiful. weather goes. Nice little reprieve. You know, I, any hurricane is is can be devastating to those in the path. I get that. But this time around, I got to admit, every time I hear it, I chuckle a little bit because my sister's name is Deb. <laughs> and when I was a little fry, it, if I wanted to kind of get it on her nerves, I called her uh-huh. Debbie. Really? She hated that? She hated that. Wow, she wanted Deb. Yeah. yeah, so so I used Debbie quite often, as often as I could. <laughs> do you think do you think zebra cakes would be as popular if they were called little Debs? I don't think no. so. You want no. that little Debbie kind of roll off your right. tongue there. That's Bank right. of Japan Deputy Governor Shinichi Uchida sent a strong 
dovish signal in the wake of historic financial market volatility in Japan by pledging to refrain from hiking interest rates when the markets are unstable. We saw what the U.S. stock markets did here. It's been uh, been a global thing. There are those who are pointing to the fact that the Bank of Japan raised interest rates um, that uh, just sort of spurred the whole sell-off in the stock markets there. Have you heard that, Chip? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, you got to do what you got to do, right? Yep. And uh, Japan has only lost, what, four decades of economic growth? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If they're going to get anything back, they probably need to take steps that are are best for them. Dow's 400 points higher this morning, by the way. Yep, yep. Uh, oh, you know what? It's been a while since we've talked about one of these. Two unions representing soybean oil factory workers in Argentina announced a strike over wages on Tuesday, halting activity at soy processing plants. After failing to reach an agreement yesterday, the unions announced plans to continue the strike today. Nothing like an Argentine pork strike, Chip. Well, and I might be helping the soybean oil market out a bit this morning. It's finally trading to the upside. Well, talks between Canada's two major railroads and the union representing about 9,000 employees are set to resume today, just days before the country's Labor Relations Board is expected to issue a ruling that could initiate a strike deadline at both companies. This could be a big deal here, Chip. Oh, yeah. Got to keep the grain moving. Yep. Well, over 500 ag-related groups led by the American Farm Bureau wrote congressional leaders last month urgently calling for a new farm bill. Senator Chuck Grassley is not surprised the farm bill is a tough sell on both sides. Grassley pointed to disagreements about SNAP and nutrition funding as holding up progress. The senator is pessimistic a new farm bill can be passed until that key issue is resolved. Through the first seven months of the year, China imported 58.33 million metric tons of soybeans. Chip, that's down 1.3% from the same period last year. Now, given hefty soybean stocks, negative crush margins, and weak demand from the livestock sector, China's soybean imports are expected to slow through year's end. Meanwhile, China's exports grew at their slowest pace in three months in July, missing expectations and adding to concerns about the outlook for the vast manufacturing sector. The trade surplus with the United States through July stood at $190.64 billion. Reuters reports EPA has confirmed it is investigating the supply chains of at least two renewable fuel producers focusing on the origins of used cooking oil used in renewable fuel production. The increased scrutiny on UCO imports, particularly from countries like China, stems from concerns that these supplies might contain virgin palm oil linked to deforestation. And just one more here, Chip. Uh, Senator Chuck Grassley and Representative Adrian Smith of Nebraska and 20 of their bipartisan colleagues wrote a letter uh, to Secretary of Commerce Gio Raimondo regarding two 4D imports from China and India. The letter noted, quote, given there is only one domestic source of 2,4-D with a limited capacity to meet domestic demand, American ag producers have to rely on imports to supplement their management plans. Chip, any changes to the duties on these products may have significant impacts yeah. on farmers. Important story right there. No, no yep. doubt about it. You need every tool that you can get uh, to, uh, to protect the crop and take care of some of the resistance out there that is happening. All right. Thank you, Davis. You bet. All right. Coming up next, we are going to have a conversation with Dr. Jim Minturk, director of the Center for Commercial Ag at Purdue University. It's Ag Economy Barometer time. We've cleared the schedule for you. Give us a call at 855-482-5524 and join the conversation. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. Glad that you are with us on this Wednesday morning. We're getting ready for the Farmer Forum coming up at the bottom of the hour. First, though, uh, each month, the Center for Commercial Ag at Purdue University, the CME Group, Dr. Jim Mintert, Dr. Michael Langemeyer at Purdue, conduct the Ag Economy Barometer. It's a survey of farmers out there and and we are lucky enough to get Jim on here every month to talk about the results and what it might mean for us going forward. Jim, it's good to talk to you again. How are you? I'm doing great and good to talk to you as well, Chip. Yeah, glad you're here. Okay, 
a little optimism showing up here, isn't there? Well, it was a surprise to us. I'm guessing it was a surprise to you too, Chip. Yeah. So the index, uh, the overall index, the barometer itself rose eight points to a reading of 113. Probably the better comparison, though, in terms of thinking about what's going on in agriculture is to compare it to a year ago. And when you do that, the index is still down 10 points compared to a year ago. Okay. But then, you know, the surprise, again, continues. The current condition index was up 10 points compared to June. But again, 21 points lower than last year at this time. And the future expectation index was up seven points compared to June. But again, it was it was five points lower than last year. Right. So, you know, as we put in the write-up, Chip, and, and you guys talk about every day, the, the, the reason it was surprising is because of the declines we saw in corn and soybean prices, especially yeah. from the time we collected data in June to the time we collected data in July, which was the 15th through the 19th of, of July. But if you look at your calendar, you might remember what else was going on the week of the 15th through the 19th of July. Does anything, anything come to mind, Chip? Um. Oh, the Republican yeah. National Convention was yeah. that week, and of course we were we were surveying and coming off a, an assassination attempt and stuff we were, like that. We were, yeah, our our survey coincided with that, and we've seen yeah. evidence in the past where political events, in particular, can have a pretty big impact on sentiment. We saw it following the 2016 election. We saw it following, to a lesser extent, following the 2020 election. Um, okay. To be honest, Chip, we got caught a little bit flat-footed. We didn't have any questions on the survey that directly addressed those issues because we already have the survey in progress. But um, we're going to ask some some questions related to more policy issues going forward to see if we can ascertain what it was, was driving this. But I do okay. think that what happened with respect to the convention that week did, um, and the attempted assassination attempt, oh. did have an impact on sentiment. Okay, those were very historic events, uh, especially the assassination attempt, uh, the the convention we do every four years. It seems like kind of a low bar to move the attitudes, Jim, and, and to offset what should have been a negative influence of lower grain prices. Yeah, and, you know, elsewhere in the survey, I think people were realistic about that. You know, you look at the Farm Financial Performance Index, uh, okay. it did go down. Um, it was down four points compared to June. It was down six points compared to a year ago. I might have expected slightly larger declines, but I think that's consistent with what was going on in people's um, operations. Uh, the Farm Capital Investment Index rose six points. That was a little bit surprising, but it still left it at a very low level and maybe was consistent with the idea that people are less worried about interest rates than they were previously, especially with the, all the talk coming from the Fed about uh, possibly reducing rates here in, in September. So, you know, I think those things kind of actually make, a, a, make more sense with respect to the underlying economics that's going on. But right. I think from the sentiment standpoint, you know, when, when particularly going back to the 2016 election and the period following that where we did some follow-up questions, people let us know they were very... Uh, concerned and, and actually thought the election would have a big impact on things like the regulatory environment for agriculture. Yeah. They thought it could have a big impact on the taxation uh, environment for agriculture. Um, so I do think there are some reasons why people will felt that way. And, and you know what? The other thing, we didn't have a direct question on the survey, but we do allow people to make open-ended comments at the end of the survey. Okay. And I read those. And you know, there were a lot of comments that suggested that they were very concerned about what might happen following this election and the idea that uh, the Republican side might be uh, uh, a little bit more in the driver's seat was was clearly going to be viewed favorably by not everybody in the survey, but there were a number of comments along those lines. Sure. sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Let's go back to that Farm Capital Investment Index. Like you said, it was up six points, but still very low at 38 the thing that impressed me is that 75% of the respondents said it's a bad time to invest. I, 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 what does that mean for us going forward if three quarters of farmers just aren't going to make any investments in their business? Well, I, that's a good question. And I think it's a little bit of an issue with respect to understanding the demographics in our survey, because our survey is representative of all farmers. It's not... Uh, it would be a little bit of a mistake to construe that in terms of being representative of the industry in terms of total investment. So it's, okay. and I say that because we tend to get a relatively large number of people every month telling us it's a bad time to make large investments. 
But some of that reflects the demographics of who we're talking to. These are people that are actively engaged in farming. So they're still commercial scale farmers, but these are also some folks that maybe have no plans to expand. Uh, perhaps they're looking towards retirement. And I think that's influencing uh, what, what we pick okay. up with respect to that farm capital investment index. But but it's still, you know, if you look at it from a longer term perspective, we were way more optimistic about investing in late 2020 and early 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah. The last two years, we've been sideways. You know, if you look at it on a chart, it's really just a sideways band between a, a range of about 30 to about 45 and most of the time between 30 and 40. So people are telling us it's not a great time to invest. And, you know, from a farm management perspective right now, what would your number one recommendation be to most farmers? Cash reduce up. capital expenditures, right? Tighten yeah. your belt, reduce CapEx is, is usually the first thing you look at. Uh, then you start looking at some other things as well. But that's the, the easy one. And given the fact that a lot of people actually made some pretty big investments when we had some very good years from 21 through 23, uh, they probably don't need to invest that much. Right. Okay. All right. I love the fact that each month uh, you add something on an annual basis and you're talking about rental rates and boy, timely, obviously, on on the question, what are you finding out about rental rates? Well, it was a little bit surprising. And I, I, given that this is still kind of early in the, the rental rate for 2025 uh, season, I guess it's, you know, maybe got to take it with a little grain of salt, but Roughly three fourths, seventy two percent of the people in the survey said they think cash rental rates in twenty twenty five will be unchanged from twenty twenty four, and then it was balanced between those who thought it might be lower and higher for the remainder. So I think thirteen percent said lower, fifteen percent said higher. But the big news was no change. But if you think about it, you know maybe that's not too surprising in the sense that even though returns in twenty twenty four look terrible, right? I mean we're really looking at, at potentially you know, one of the worst years we've had in the last roughly 15, 16 years. So I think it's going to be really a challenge. But we came into this with strong balance sheets and strong working capital. And historically, it tends to take more than one bad year to see very much change in cash rental rates. And I suspect that's one of the things that's going on here with respect to people expecting to see those rental rates stay about the same. Okay. All right. Jim, when when you think about the the barometer and what it is telling us overall what is the bottom line when so if you were going to take these results and present them to a group of investors on Wall Street what would you feature well one of the groups that i, I can have a chance to take, speak to periodically are some folks from Wall Street but i also speak to some people for example in the farm machinery industry Mm -hmm. And this confirms what we're hearing elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a challenging environment to move farm machinery here and at the end of 24, and I think spilling over throughout 2025 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got large inventories already. Um, farmers, many of them are well-equipped, well-capitalized already. They don't need to make purchases from a, a managerial perspective, uh, an improved efficiency perspective. One of the challenges will be can they come up with some new technology that is, in fact, cost reducing that actually makes a farm more efficient? Yeah. Uh, that's going to be one of the big challenges going forward, because otherwise people are going to hold back, I think. Right, right. You know, I have proven to myself over all, all of our conversations that I'm not very good at predicting what the next survey is going to tell us. OK, but it doesn't stop me from thinking about it. I, I, the the August results are not going to be this optimistic because of the continued pressure on the grains, because of the announcements from Deere, the announcements from Kinsey, the scaling back. I, it feels to me like there's some pessimism that's growing. Do you feel that? Yeah, I, I think in my best guess, and we were a little yeah. bit surprised at this one. We were caught a little bit flat-footed. I think in August, we're likely to get back to more along the lines of what the underlying economics are doing. And I think you're right. I think it's going to be the negativity of, of prices starting to weigh on people. Um, yeah. The caveat is we've got another convention coming up and who knows how the political That's environment right. could have influenced things. That's exactly right. Exactly right. It's always fascinating stuff, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Look forward to visiting with you next month. You bet. That is Dr. Jim Minter, Director of the Center for Commercial Ag at Purdue University.
Farmer Forums next. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady. Beach, a look at that soy complex, and it feels like even though we're getting some help from the soybean oil market, the beans and meal just don't want to give up this pressure, do they? Yeah, th- both those markets are leaking lower, Chip, at, at mid-morning. So about 5 to $0.07 cents lower in soybeans, uh, 5 to $6 plus lower in, in soy meal. So notable losses there. I, I think the important thing is that uh, we are above the recent lows in, in soybeans. And, and so uh, if that support holds, uh, we should avoid a, a big washout in, in uh, the price action. Uh, if it does give away, uh, then, you know, look out because we're probably going to face more technical based selling at that point in time. Now, you mentioned soy oil. It's trading sharply to the upside. A couple factors there. Crude oil futures are, are sharply higher this morning, so that's lending some support. And then the uh, oilseed worker strike in, in Argentina that's into day two uh, is also lending some psychological support, if nothing else. All right. Well, we've also got corn and wheat under pressure this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Corn, three to four cents lower. Uh, the wheat market, it had been trading to the upside, but uh, now we've given up those gains and, and trading oh, about three to five cents lower in most of the contracts at, at mid-morning. All right. Take us over to the livestock trade. What's happening? Well, uh, both live cattle and feeders are, are trying to work to the upside, uh, just not a lot of buyer interest there. And, and so um, just kind of waiting around to see, you know, we had that big washout uh, last Thursday, Friday, and then it continued on Monday. Um, and we've been trying to stabilize from that point, uh, waiting on cash cattle trade to develop. It's probably going to be steady to weaker for the week, um, but uh, just not much buyer interest at the moment. And then hog futures are leaking to the downside uh, on pressure from the cash index. Thank you, Brian. Pro Farmer Editor, Brian Grady. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. In the morning, you're coffeeed up and you're thinking. In the afternoon, you've calmed down, but you're still thinking. We're here all day. AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk. It is Wednesday and time for this week's Farmer Forum. Let's get it started. Tim Burrock from Iowa. Tim, good morning, my friend. How are you? I am all coffeeed up, Chip. <laughs> good deal. But good are deal. you thinking? <laughs> I guarantee. Oh, I'm thinking. thinking. Absolutely. Atta boy. Atta boy. All coffeeed up and thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Fantastic, Frank Howie. It has been way too long, Frank. It is good to talk with you, Frank's from North Carolina. Welcome, my friend. Glad to be on, Chip. Good deal. Good deal. Okay, Tim. I want to start with you. We're going to talk financial conditions and everything, but we got to talk crop conditions first. What's your situation? How are things looking at the Burrock Farms over around Arlington? given enough time things look pretty good now all the tile line crops have had enough time to grow and even out pollination on corn occurred it on the tile lines first but it filled in between the same with beans you know and i took a little tour around iowa here oh, a couple of weeks ago and you get away from here and things really look really good of course we've, there's the northwest iowa problems but Overall, it looks good, and the weather really looks like it's going to continue to have it look good. Yep, yep. You know, it, it. we're at that time of the year when we're used to talking about the concerns about heat and and so on, but these cool temperatures are going to slow down the crop. Um, actually, as long as, as long as we can add a few days to the end of the growing season, these cool temperatures help this crop gain weight right now. I mean, it's... It's setting up pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. We're just finishing pollination. We weren't planted early. The early early planted crops uh, look really good. You know, in the area, they escaped the problems. And the other thing we're watching really close is disease. You know, we're ready to spray. But the disease pressure, at least in my region, is really low. Yeah. And it's a great debate 
of whether we need to search. We should spend the money or not at $3.75 corn. Right, right. I heard a plane flying this morning. It was out. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where it was or what it was doing, but it had the sound of an aerial application happening over here. So there's some of that happening. So, all right. Let's bring in Frank. Uh, Frank, what's your situation with Hurricane Debbie? Uh, we're expecting a lot of rain uh, tonight and tomorrow, and the winds have died down, but uh, we're still going to get some 30, 40 mile hour winds. But we're uh, we had a drought back in June, and now uh, for about six to seven weeks, we didn't have hardly any rainfall starting in late May. And then around the 1st of July, it started raining, and we've had over 14 inches of rain since then. And uh, if we get the rain they're predicting, we're going to have river flooding uh, along the PD River, which uh, could impact uh, the bottom land. Corn. Okay, that, that dry stretch, what did it do to your corn and soybean crops down there? It, it really punished the corn, especially early planting corn. Uh, there, there's been some fields, in, I farm in North and South Carolina, some fields in South Carolina that have been zeroed out with zero yield. Uh, it was just devastating the heat we had along with the dry weather. And we, we had, we came from real wet conditions until all that dry weather and heat. And the corn just didn't have a spring root under it and really got punished. Yeah. Yeah. You know, over the years, the the southeast, the Carolinas, Georgia, and then down across the Gulf states have had kind of a swing effect on the national average corn yield. It's either helped out or really hurt us, and it doesn't feel like the the southeast is going to help us much this year at all, does it? No, sir. Uh, it's pretty widespread, even up into uh, Virginia uh, this year. But the uh, irrigated corn is is good. We we basically left our pivots running for a month straight uh, because it was so dry and so hot that the water was evaporating just about as fast as we were putting it on there. But I do think we're going to have a good irrigated crop. Okay. Uh, we started harvesting some dry land. Uh, uh, earlier this week but uh and it, it's you know disappointing on the yields but the, the yeah. quality is good because we got large kernels from the late rains that we received so what did pollinate got pollinated but there's a lot of stalks with no ears yeah yep dug on it most of that corn go to the hog industry down there frank um, most of the area we farm goes for chickens and turkey okay. feed. Uh, the hogs are a little further to the east, but uh, yes, yeah, so if North Carolina were, were a country, uh, it'd be the seventh largest importer of corn in the world where, where that's deficient on corn. And a lot of that corn comes out of uh, Ohio uh, by rail to, yeah. uh, to feed all the, the poultry and hogs we have in our state. Holy smokes, I had not heard that stat. North Carolina would be the seventh largest importer in the world if it was a country. Yep. Wow. Yep. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, so hog production down there. We've got hog production up in Iowa, obviously. Tim's a, a hog producer. Tim, what are you making a Prop 12 and Q3 and all these issues? Is it going to have an influence on how you raise hogs? Well, Chip, I'm, I'm out of the hog business, so oh, okay. I, I'm not in it anymore, so, but uh, yeah, they still have influences. And I want to yeah. thank Frank for importing all that corn, tell him to do more. <laughs> Keep it going, we'll, we'll man. We'll need more this year for sure. <laughs> yep, yep. So do those hog issues get much conversation in in North Carolina, Frank, Prop 12, Q3 out of Massachusetts? Well, you know, there, there's been a moratorium for years in North Carolina where you can't build new hog houses because yeah. of the odor concerns from the neighbors. You can rebuild a farm you take out of production, but the, 
we we can't increase the size of uh, of the herd of hogs in North Carolina. But uh, yeah, I, you know, anytime you have more regulations, it's a, a problem. But I'm not in the hog business. I raise yeah. uh, have a cow calf operation, right? Right. In addition to row crops. Okay. Okay, Tim. Financial conditions. We just had the conversation with. Jim Midter from Purdue University, the July survey showed a little bit of optimism, which, as he said, caught him flat-footed. If I'm looking forward to the month ahead, I think things might soften up a bit on the optimism. Um, it, what are your thoughts on the on the farm economy right now? Well, you know, there's a little optimism when you look at maybe the production, but when you look at what we're selling things for now or what the what you can contract for, there's not much optimism. It's just not good. So there's no profitability left. And the, the old crop corn, you're basically moving it now, giving it away to make room for the new one. Some people are moving it on delayed price. And I don't know how that's going to turn out. Not but good. I don't see a lot of optimism. I mean, it, people are kind of, I'd call it melancholy lads right now and irritated with themselves for the job of marketing they have done for the past year. Now they're trying to figure out how to deal with the next one. Yep. Yep. Does that describe things in North Carolina, Frank? Um, we were fortunate. We sold our crops uh, last year and didn't carry over crops. And that was the right thing to do. Uh, but farmers are very, uh, uh, put out with the prices and the weather. I mean, nobody is uh, excited about buying anything. Um, I had somebody call me the other day, want to sell me a farm. And I told them I was just mostly interested in keeping the ones I already had. <laughs> it's, sometimes you got to get into that preservation uh, <laughs> mode. And, and it, it sounds like that's where farmers are. The the survey question that they asked on rents, Tim, that that there is a fair – the attitude is steady on rents, but um, there's 15 16% that are leaning to the downside on rents. Are you hearing any lower rental rates uh, for the year ahead? Well, you know, to hear it yet, you know, the whole month of August, at least in Iowa – you know, is negotiation period mm -hmm. and everybody's struggling with what to do. And there's a lot of talk chip about rents need to move down. So I personally, I'm looking forward to having the farm management companies lead this charge because they let it when it went up and they said, <laughs> things have to be fair and to make things fair again. I'm hoping that the farm management companies will lead the, you know, lead the yeah. trend to lower rents. And I think they recognize it. And I, I expect them to do that. And, and I, and that'll help. And it, you know, there'll be some movement this year and with normal crops mm -hmm. in the 25 growing season, there'll be more movement in August of 25. Yeah. I would think that they would at least be open to the conversation, uh, and I, I, because you I know say. that that conversation is going to be had. There's there's no question about it. Okay, we are in the middle of the Farmer Forum. We've got Tim Barak from Iowa, Frank Howie from North Carolina. A couple of issues that I want to get to yet, including does Waltz bring a bigger ag voice than Vance? We'll discuss next. You're listening to AgriTalk, where the conversation begins. Join us at 855-4-TALK-AG. Welcome back. We are in the middle of this week's Farmer Forum. Tim Burrock from Iowa, Frank Howie from North Carolina. I'm your host, Chip Flory. Davis is here as well. I am. Guys, during the break, I'm thinking to myself, Frank made the comment that there's not a lot of interest in in investing and in buying uh, out there right now, you know, preservation mode. Uh, Tim made the comment about there's going to be conversation with with farm managers about 
lowering rental rates this year. You guys, it, you're talking about some things that would de- de- define a recession in the ag economy. Tim, is that where we're at? I think we are. When you look at the John Deere layoffs, the Firestone layoffs, uh, everything that's going on and the lack of machinery moving, ag's in a recession. A lot of people don't realize it yet. I'm sure the politicians don't. They're so busy busy uh, looking the other way, telling us how great things are. But yeah, I think we are. And uh, I think the country's starting down. And I was with some international farmers last week, and I kept asking, are we in a world recession? And a lot of different farmers from around the world are questioning what's happening because of their prices. Yeah. What do you think, Frank? I mean, and does it matter? Yeah, Chip, interest rates have got to come down. Uh, It doesn't make sense to invest in ag right now because of the interest rates. Uh, If you've already got equipment financed at low rates, nobody's going to trade for a higher rate. So that's why the equipment layoffs are happening. It's real simple. I mean, interest rates have got to come down or or prices have got to go up. And these hedge funds have shorted all these commodities and drove them down. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's the value of the crop, but I don't think the value is low as they have driven these prices. And there's even talk that they're going to drive them lower. And how it's going to affect my operation is we're going to plant less winter wheat because there's just no money to be made at these prices. You know, I can be uh, broke, but I don't have to be broke and tired. So we're going to cut back and we're going to put more land and grass for cattle and expand our cow-calf operation and cut back on our okay. cropland acres. Okay. How far are you going to, are you starting that expansion in the beef cow herd now? We've been doing it for years, but we're going to accelerate oh. it. Yeah, we, we have about uh, 2,500 cow-calf operation, which is big for this part of the country. Yeah. It's it's big even out west, Frank. <laughs> Come on. There's no doubt about that. No doubt. All right. You guys, political issues have taken center stage. Um, we uh, got Tim Walls uh, as the uh, running mate for Vice President Harris. We've got J.D. Vance as the running mate for... For um, President or former President Trump, Tim, I'll just ask you. You know, we we hear about Governor Walls all the time from our friends just north of the border. Uh, which do you think is bringing a bigger voice to agriculture, Vance or Walls? Well, Walls has got a history. When he was Congressman, he was on the Ag Committee. Yeah. So. You know, he's got some background there. So I think it's going to be interesting in going forward if he even talks about that. There's not much ag talk at the political conventions. Republicans didn't, and we can, we'll be able to monitor the Democrats. But I, I don't think ag's even on the radar screen for the presidential yeah. campaign, and it's too bad. Trade is huge. We got problems with trade with both parties. Biden Harris didn't do much of anything, didn't lift any tariffs. Trump talking about more tariffs. None of that is good for us. Right. What's your take yeah, on tariffs this? Are terrible for ag- ter- ter- tra- tariffs are terrible for agriculture. And uh, it worries me. Um, I remember when Trump was president before um, soybeans. And they they had about a fifty cent trading range for about three years because of his tariffs in China backing away from buying our soybeans. Yep, yep. You know, and the thing is with tariffs, I it, I'm not convinced that 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 either the Republican choice or the Democratic choice the Democrat choice is going to bring much relief either way. Is it, Tim? I mean, they're both talking about increasing tariff rates on china 
Yeah, and that's a major problem for us. And that's, you know, just on trade, if you use that trade issue as your political choice, like a lot of people use abortion, one a one mm-hmm. vote issue, I don't have any place to vote on the trade issue. So yeah, I've got to look beyond that to make my choices. And so where are you looking? I like Trump's other policies. Well, I like Trump's other policies better, but I sure don't like his trade policies at all. Right. Right. What about you, Frank? What other issues are you looking at? Um, you know, um, I think the majority of farmers, uh, especially in North Carolina, will be supporting Trump. But, you know, the, the tariffs and the rhetoric, the first time he was president, I thought he was just saying that to get elected. But he, uh, he sure, uh, you know, cost the American farmers a lot of money and my size operation uh, it was millions of dollars and the payments were capped that he gave that and I, there were a lot of dollars that I just plain lost out on and just because of the size of my operation yeah yeah exactly it 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 uh, you know we talk about the the battle between big and small and all the time and boy when some issues uh like what we had with with Trump and, and the trade issues pop up and they try to make things equitable or equal or however you want to say it with those those payments from the Commodity Credit Corporation and it just seems to never work out exactly right. You guys were great. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Tim, we really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. You're welcome. Love Frank, it. great great job man thank you thank you look forward to talking to you again chip all right tim burak from iowa frank howie from north carolina come back this afternoon